in uh, getting uh, Dr. Williams here. Uh, we had uh, we needed a plane to do it, and uh, the uh, transportation has been provided by Gary Peterson. And Gary Peterson is a Texas Tech alum in the oil business. He's from Canyon, Texas, and he came to Texas Tech, and no one ever told him you can't do that. And uh, and and he believes in free markets, and I asked him. And he said, and he just, he was so upset. And I thought, well, I wonder what this is about. He said, I won't, I'm going to be out of the country. I won't be able to be there. And uh, so I promised him, uh, uh, Dr. Williams, I'd get him a book. And uh, so uh, he had his plane go get you and, and bring you back. But uh, 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 Gary Peterson's done well. He owns 25% uh, of the Houston Astros and 20% of the uh, Houston Texans. So for a Red Raider that just grew up in Canyon, Texas, and decided he'd go to college, he's done well. Thanks to free market. <laughs> the uh, director of our free market institute uh, is here. We also, and, and I may have missed him, but uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dwayne Nellis and his wife, uh, they were, y'all stand up and be recognized. <laughs> Dwayne, uh, we interviewed him. He had been president of the flagship uh, school in, in Idaho, the University of Idaho. We interviewed him, and I told him about these two institutes, and I said, what do you think? He said, I think they're great. I said, you're my guy. Uh, that, uh, uh, and he believes in academic freedom and, uh, and uh, just is, uh, does an excellent job. Um, our uh, uh, director of the Free Market Institute is uh, Dr. Ben Powell. And he's an energetic young man. He had his uh, uh, BS in uh, economics from the University of Massachusetts. He got a master's at uh, uh, George Mason. And then when he got his PhD, uh, his professor that was teaching and was in charge of his PhD uh, was Dr. Williams. And so uh, that's one of the reasons we got him. <laughs> And this time, I would like for uh, Ben Powell uh, to come introduce our special guest, Dr. Ben Powell. Well, thank you, Chancellor Hansen, and in particular, thank you for helping making this event possible. Because while Dr. Walter Williams is a pleasure to deal with, uh, he doesn't have much tolerance for the harassment that the TSA gives him. Uh, so if it wasn't for Chancellor Hansen arranging a plane, he wouldn't be here. And I guess before I introduce you, I, I have to apologize, Dr. Williams, as I, I look out at the crowd here, by an accident of where the doors were located and how people entered, I apparently have produced the most left-leaning audience that you could have in, in love. <laughs> Chancellor Hans introduced the Free Market Institute and, and our mission to teach and study free markets and how they operate. And we're going to be a collection of scholars here at the university across disciplines who conduct research as a team and individually as our own academics and teach classes through other academic units here on campus. But one important part of the mission of this institute is also to do outreach to the wider community in West Texas and for that matter across the nation and the world about how the private enterprise system functions. And this event is part of that mission. For some of it, we're going to write for the newspapers. You might have seen a few columns by us in the AJ so far. Uh, we'll do media outreach for television and, and radio. But we're also going to host a regular lecture series here on campus. And if you're interested in talks like this, I'd recommend if you didn't sign up on your way in, there is a few sign-up sheets out there on your way out where you can be informed when we're going to have these other events. You can also like us on Facebook, and then you'll see all sorts of stuff that we're up to. We plan to do about three of these lectures per semester. Not all of them are going to be as high profile as having Dr. Williams in here, but all of them will be excellent communicators, well, at least for economists. Uh, but at least once a semester, we plan to have uh, someone of Dr. Williams' stature here. So Dr. Williams is the John Olin Distinguished Professor of Economics at George Mason University, my alma mater. He's been there since 1980. From two, 1995 to 2001, he was the chairman of the, that department, and that's actually the capacity that I got to know him in. He earned his PhD from UCLA. He has honorary doctorates from Virginia University, excuse me, Virginia Union University, Grove City College, Washington and Jefferson College, and my personal favorite, University Francisco 
University of Francisco Miraquin in Guatemala, uh, which is a beacon of liberty in a country that's often hostile to it. He's the author of 150 scholarly publications and 10 books, including The State Against Blacks, which was later made into a PBS documentary, Good Intentions. He's also the author of South Africa's War Against Capitalism, and more recently, the three books that were available outside, Liberty vs. the Tyranny of Socialism, Up from the Projects, A Biography, and Race and Economics, How Much Can Be Blamed on Discrimination. He's also a media sensation. In fact, I actually first experienced Dr. Williams when watching a PBS series entitled Free to Choose that Milton Friedman put together. Actually, he put it together when I was a toddler, probably, but I was in college, and I saw Dr. Williams participating in a panel on that. In addition, he's been on Nightline, Face the Nation, Crossfire, 2020, back when it was cool, and John Stossa was a co-host on it. Uh, and he was a regular guest on the Nightly Business Report. You all probably know him, though, either through his occasional guest hosting of the Rush Limbaugh Show, or more likely, he's a nationally syndicated columnist. In fact, if I'm correct, the most syndicated economist across the nation, and 140 papers carry his weekly column, including our own Avalanche Journal here in Lubbock. And that's how this event actually came about, is I moved here in January, and invariably when I met someone and they found out that I did my graduate work a decade ago at George Mason, the next question I'd get was, do you know Walter Williams? <laughs> and after the umpteenth time that happened, I finally decided I better drop Dr. Williams a note and ask him to come out here and give a talk for us all. So it was really the demand from all of you that brought him here, and I thank you for that. And with no further ado, Dr. Williams, please. Thank you very much for that uh, very warm welcome. And it is a, indeed a delight to be in Lubbock with uh, so many friends. Um, the, the title of my talk this evening is The Legitimate Role of Government in a Free Society. Now in the course of my comments, I'm going to say things that might appear to be uh, mean, uh, <laughs> Politi politically incorrect, uh, insensitive, to the extent that any of those things might be true, you should feel free to raise any question that you want during the question and answer period. Raise hard questions because these are some difficult issues that we face. Uh, don't worry about, don't show me any undue courtesy because I'm your guest. Uh, raise hard questions, don't worry about Embarrassing me. <laughs> Just a little bit bigger. Don't, don't worry about embarrassing me uh, because <laughs> I, am, I am unembarrassable. The only way you could possibly embarrass me is to suggest that I'm not pretty good in basketball. <laughs> and, and that's a matter of ethnic pride that I take seriously. <laughs> <clears throat> One justification for the growth of government far beyond what the founders envisioned for us is to promote fairness and justice. Well, that might be a worthy goal, but we might also want to ask, what is fairness and justice? What is the legitimate role of government in a free society? Let me spend just a few moments discussing what the founders of our nation saw as the legitimate role of the federal government. And to do that, let's turn to the rule book that they gave us, namely the United States Constitution. Most of what the founders saw as the legitimate role for the federal government is found in Article I, Section 8 of our Constitution. And let me just briefly quote sections thereof. It says, Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, excises, to pay the debts, provide for the common defense, and the general welfare of the United States. Congress also has the power or is authorized to borrow money on the credit of the United States to regulate commerce with foreign nations 
among the several states and Indian tribes. To coin money, to establish post office and post roads, to raise and support armies. The framers or the founders granted Congress taxing and spending authority for these and a few other activities that are listed in Article I, Section 8 of the United States Constitution. If it's not there, Congress is not authorized to do it. Nowhere in the Constitution do we find authority for up to three quarters of what Congress taxes and spends on today. In other words, there's no constitutional authority for bank bailouts, food stamps, foreign aid, farm, farm subsidies, not to mention midnight basketball. <laughs> I think that we can say, we can safely say that we have made a significant departure from the constitutional principles of individual freedom and limited government that made us a rich nation and the envy of the world in the first place. These principles of freedom were embodied in our nation through the combined institutions of private ownership of property and free enterprise. Through numerous successful attacks, private property and free enterprise, what the framers envisioned, are mere skeletons of their past. Thomas Jefferson anticipated this when he said, and I'm quoting him, the natural progress of things is for government to gain ground and for liberty to yield. The best way of looking at this process of how government is gaining a ground and liberty yielding is to ask what has happened to government taxation and spending. Ladies and gentlemen, there's only one way to look at taxes. Taxes represent government claims on private property. And indeed, if government were to tax private property at 100%, it would confiscate private property and taxes are going up. An even better measure of what the government is doing is to look at what has happened to spending, federal spending, or, or spending in general. Let's put this in perspective. In 1902, expenditures at all federal, I mean government expenditures at all levels of government totaled $1.7 billion. In 1902, the average taxpayer paid $60 a year in federal, state, and local taxes. In fact, from 1787 until 1920, federal expenditures were only 3% of the GDP except during wartime, as opposed to 25% today. Today, federal expenditures alone are over $3.8 billion. State and local governments spend close to $3 trillion. The average taxpayer today pays more than $10,000 in federal, state, and local taxes. Now, what's the significance of all this, ladies and gentlemen? Well, the significance is, is that as time goes by, you and I own less and less of our most valuable property, namely ourselves and the fruits of our labor. Another way of looking at this is that the average taxpayer works from January 1st until mid-April to pay federal, state, and local taxes. Now that means that we're going on f five months out of the year and we do not have the rights to decide how the fruits of our labor will be used. Somebody else makes that decision. Keep in mind 
that a working definition of slavery is that you work 12 months out of the year and it is someone else that makes the decision how the fruits of your labor will be used. Now in the economic sphere, the founders thought that relatively free markets or what some people call capitalism was the most effective social organization for the promotion of individual freedom. Indeed, capitalism is defined as a system wherein individuals are free to pursue their own interests so long as they do not violate the property rights of others. Indeed, capitalism is a system, or free markets is, is a system where there is voluntary exchange. There are private property rights held in goods and services. Much of the original intent of the United States Constitution as seen in the document itself and the Federalist Papers and other papers that debated the Constitution in 1787 was to bring about a climate in which this, social, this kind of social organization could exist, namely free markets. Now the great benefit of the free enterprise system is that through private ownership and control it minimizes the capacity of one person to coerce another person. Additionally, the coercive powers of the state are minimized. The coercive powers of the state are, are restricted to the legitimate functions of the state in a free society. And what are the legitimate functions of the state in a free society? Well, one legitimate function is to protect you and me from international thugs violating our private property rights. So that says one legitimate function of government is to provide for national defense. Another legitimate function of government is to protect you and me from domestic thugs violating our private property rights. So that says at some level of government there ought to be police protection. And I might add, when I talk about private property rights, I'm concerned that I'm talking about the individual as well as his house and his other property because I belong to Walter Williams and you belong to you. We're our own private property. Other legitimate functions of the state and a free society are those of enforcing constitutional order, the adjudication of disputes, and the provision of certain public goods public goods as an economist would define them. In order to pay for these legitimate functions and matter of fact constitutionally mandated functions, each citizen is obligated to pay his share. Now, for the last half century, or maybe even longer, Free enterprise and what it implies has been under unrelenting attack in our country. Americans from all walks of life, whether they realize or not, <coughs> excuse me, have demonstrated a deep and abiding contempt for private property rights and economic freedom. Free enterprise is threatened today, not because of its failure, but because of its success. That is, free enterprise has been so successful, excuse me, <clears throat> has been so successful in eliminating the traditional problems of mankind, such as disease, pestilence, hunger, and gross poverty, that all other human problems appear to us to be at once inexcusable and unbearable. The desire by many Americans to eliminate, <coughs> to eliminate these so-called unbearable and inexcusable problems, inexcusable problems has led us away from the basic ideals and principles upon which our nation was built. In the name of other ideas, ideals such as equality of income, 
sex and race balance, affordable housing, medical care, orderly markets, consumer protection, energy conservation, just to name a few, we have abandoned many personal freedoms. As a result of widespread control by our government in order to achieve these so-called higher objectives, we are increasingly being subordinated to the point where considerations of personal liberty are but secondary and tertiary matters. In other words, they're increasingly uh, considered to be dirt. Now you might say, well, what's this guy talking about? Our liberties being trampled upon. Well, let me give you an example. Suppose I write the United States Congress and I say, my name is Walter Williams and I am an emancipated adult. I am fully capable of taking care of my own retirement needs. If I fail to do so, let me die on the streets or go out begging, but stop taking money out of my paycheck for your government retirement program, namely Social Security. How do you think that'd be greeted? <laughs> it'd be greeted with contempt. Now here are people telling you and me how much we should set, set aside out of each week's pay, paycheck for retirement. What if they told us how much to set aside out of each week's pay for food, for housing, for vacations, for our, for, for our children's education? We would view it as tyranny. What right do they have? Well, the ultimate end to this process is totalitarianism, which is no more than a reduced form of servitude. Remember, if you take steps towards any goal, it's just a matter of when you're going to get there. I'm not saying that we are a totalitarian nation yet. But if you ask the question, which way are we headed, tiny steps at a time, are we headed towards more personal liberty or towards more government control over our lives? It would have to unambiguously be the latter. Or as David Hume, the great philosopher David Hume said, it's seldom that liberty of any kind is lost all at once. It's always lost bit by bit. Or maybe a more insightful way of describing this process is to consider what Leonard Reed said. Leonard Reed was the founder of the Foundation for Economic Education, the first free market institute in the United States in, uh, in 1946. And Leonard Reed said, if you wanted to take liberty away from Americans, you had to know how to cook a frog. Leonard Reed said, you can't cook a frog by putting on a pot of boiling water and then throwing the frog in the water. Because the frog's reflexes are so quick as soon as his feet touched the boiling water, he would hop away and be free. He said that the way to cook a frog is to put on a pot of cold water, put the frog in the water, and heat it up bit by bit. And by the time the frog realized he was being cooked, it was too late. That's the same thing with Americans. If anybody came over here talking about taking away all of our liberties all at once, we would righteously rebel but they can talk about taking away our liberties bit by bit. The primary justification for the attack on personal liberty, private property, economic freedom, can be found in people's desire for government to do good. We all say things like, government should care for the poor, government should help the disadvantaged, Government should help the elderly, failing businesses. Government should help college students and other deserving segments of our society. Well, this might be nice to say that, but we have to recognize that government has no resources of its very own. Now, what I mean by that, ladies and gentlemen, those programs coming out of Washington or out of your state capital, they don't represent congressmen and legislators reaching in their own pockets and sending out the money. 
Moreover, there's no tooth fairy giving him the money. <laughs> there's no Santa Claus giving them the money. Now, once you recognize that government has no resources of its very own, that forces you to recognize that the only way the government can give one American citizen one dollar is to first, through intimidation, threats, and coercion, confiscate that dollar from some other American. Now, if you believe I'm being too loose with the terminology, intimidation, threats, and coercion, and confiscation, you have until April 15th next year to check me out. <laughs> now, we Americans, we ask government to do things that if a private person did the identical thing, we would roundly condemn him as ordinary despicable thief. <clears throat> For example, I might see an elderly lady sleeping out on a grate in the dead of winter. She's hungry, she needs some medical attention, and she needs some shelter. Now I could walk up to Dr. Benjamin Powell with a gun in my hand and say, Ben, give me your $200. Then having gotten this $200, I can go down and help the lady out, buy her some medical attention, some food, and shelter. Would you find me guilty of a crime? I'd be guilty of a crime regardless of what I did with the money. I'd be guilty of theft, because what is theft? Theft is taking the rightful property of one person and giving it to another to whom it does not belong. Now, most Americans can agree with me on that. They'll say, yeah, Williams, that's theft. Now, is there any conceptual distinction between that act, where I walked up the Ben, and when the agents of the United States Congress tell me, Walter Williams, you know that $200 you made last week, that you had planned to buy a nice bottle of Chateau de Chem Sauterne wine? <laughs> you will not do that with the money. You'll give it to us, and we will go downtown and help the lady out. I assert that there's no conceptual distinction between the two acts. If you press me for a distinction, the first act is illegal theft, and the second act is legal theft. It's just a matter of legality. And moral people cannot be guided by legality alone. Because there are many things in this world that are or were legal, but clearly immoral. That is, slavery was legal. Does that make it moral? The Nazi persecution of Jews was legal. Did that make it moral? So we, as moral people, we must ask the question, is it moral to take what belongs to one person and give it to another to whom it does not belong? Now, don't misunderstand me, ladies and gentlemen. I believe in helping our fellow man in need. I think it is praiseworthy and laudable when a person seeks to help his fellow man by reaching into his own pockets. I think that reaching into someone else's pockets to help your fellow man in need is worthy of condemnation. And for the Christians among us, when God gave Moses the commandment, thou shalt not steal, I'm quite sure he did not mean thou shalt not steal unless you got a majority vote in Congress. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> now, in a free society, we want most of our relationships, if not all of them, to be voluntary, and we want to minimize involuntary relationships, involuntary exchange. Now, some people get hung up with the words involuntarily, involuntary versus voluntary. And so for voluntary exchange, I like to use, I used to tell people, I love seduction. What's the essence of seduction? 
And those, many of you got here, your hormones are not uproar, so. <laughs> so I have to explain seduction. The essence of seduction is when we proposition our fellow man the following way. We say to him, if you make me feel good, I'll make you feel good. Now, that's what, and, and seduction goes on. All around, we, it's all around us. For example, I go into my grocer with $3 in my hand. And I proposition him. I say, if you make me feel good, give me that gallon of milk. I'll make you feel, I'll make you feel good by giving you the $3. And if he accepts the offer, he's better off because he valued the $3 more than the milk. And I'm better off because I value the milk more than $3. And for those of you who remember your game theory, we call that a positive sum game, where both parties benefit in their own estimation. Now, involuntary exchange is rape. Now, I'm against all forms of rape. Because what is the essence of rape? Is when we, rape is, is when we proposition our fellow man in the following way. We say to him, if you don't make me feel good, I'm gonna make you feel bad. That'd be where I went into the grocer with a gun in my hand. And I say, if you don't make me feel good, give me that gallon of milk, I'm gonna make you feel bad, blow your brains out. Clearly, I'm better off, but the gross is worse off. Now, some people that, you know, Williams, um, these things you complain about are rail against, it represents we are a democracy and majority rules. Well, first, I try to tell a person that the founders did not intend for us to be a democracy, but instead a republic. As a matter of fact, do we say we pledge allegiance to the flag for the democracy for which it stands? Or during the 1861 war, was it the battle hymn of the democracy? Now, so I try to explain to person, well, uh, the framers did not intend for us to be a democracy. But I tell them also that, that gang rape is not better than individualized rape. <laughs> I mean, just because you vote to rape somebody doesn't make it right. That is, in other words, to say it more politely, a majority consensus does not establish morality. Widespread private ownership and control of property is consistent with seduction. Widespread government ownership and control is consistent with rape maximization. Government is the major source of rape-like exchanges because the essence of our relationship with government is that if, they don't make, if we don't make them feel good, they're gonna make us feel bad. Now, a lot of people say, and you hear a lot of it on college campuses, that we need a big, powerful government to offset the power of big business. Well, that's just plain nonsense. Despite the alleged power and the bigness of industrial giants like IBM, AT&T, General Motors, in a free market, the only way they can get a dollar from us is if we volunteer to give it to them. For example, Exxon is a powerful company. How can it get a dollar out of me? Well, I must voluntarily get out of my chair, voluntarily get in my car, voluntarily pull up in this man's lot, and voluntarily buy some gasoline from him. That does not describe my relationship with government. Now, of course, I would be remiss if I did not point out that these people can get our money, whether we want to give it to them or not, but what do they have to do? They have to get permission from Congress or our state legislators to rip us off. For example, uh, Chrysler or the farmers in many places are having trouble. Well, the farmers know where I live. Chrysler knows where I live. They could come to my house and knock on my door and say, buddy, can you spare a dime? I'd probably tell them, go play in the traffic. <laughs> and they know that. So instead of coming and asking me to voluntarily help them out, they'll go to the Congress and say, well, would you take Williams's money through your agents at the IRS? 
That's how big business can get money from us, whether we want to give it to them or not. And it's a whole lot of that. Now, the free market and voluntary exchange are roundly denounced by today's defenders of what I call the new human rights. These defenders of the new human rights are the chief supporters of reduced private property rights, reduced rights to profits, they are anti-competition, and pro-monopoly. These are people who believe that they have more intelligence and superior wisdom to the masses. And they believe that they have been uh, ordained to forcibly impose that wisdom on the rest of us, whether we want it or not. These people's plan requires the elimination of the market. And why do do-gooders, or why do tyrants, want to eliminate the free market, or to at least attenuate it? Well, the free market implies voluntary exchange. And tyrants do not trust that people behaving voluntarily will do what the tyrant thinks that they ought to do. So they want to replace the market with economic planning, sometimes called industrial planning. I will give you a definition of economic planning that will last you the rest of your lives. And for those of you who are freshmen, it will last you through graduate school. <laughs> economic planning is nothing more than the forcible superseding of somebody else's plan by the powerful elite. For example, I might plan to buy a Honda motorcycle from a Japanese producer. The powerful elite will say, Williams, we're going to supersede your plan through tariffs and quotas because we think you ought to buy a Harley Davidson. Or my daughter might plan to work for the hardware store guy down the street for $4 an hour. He says it's okay, she says it's okay, the mother says it's okay, and her father says it's okay. But the powerful elite will say, we're going to supersede that plan because it's not being transacted at the prices we think it ought to be transacted, namely $7.25 an hour. <clears throat> now, many of these people are just evil people, but <laughs> many of them do it in the name of good. Now, do-gooders fail to realize that most good done in the world is not done in the name of good. In other words, if you were to ask me, Williams, what's that human motivation that gets the most wonderful things done? I would say greed. I love greed. I'm not talking about robbing people, ripping off people, misrepresentation. I'm talking about people trying to get as much as they can for themselves. Let me give you an example of it. Last winter, you had Texas cattle ranchers getting up very often, sometimes in blizzards, running down stray cows, maybe trying, you may get kicked by the cows, making this personal sacrifice to make sure that New Yorkers had beef on their shelves. You have Idaho potato farmers getting up in the morning, doing back-breaking work, dirt underneath their fingernails, sun beating down on them, bugs biting them, making this personal sacrifice to make sure New Yorkers also had potatoes. Now, do you think they're doing that because they love New Yorkers? <laughs> <clears throat> They may hate New Yorkers. I'm not that wild about New Yorkers myself. <laughs> but they make sure that beef and potatoes gets to New York every day of the week. Why? Because they love themselves. They want more for themselves. And in a free market, the way that you get more for yourself is to please your fellow man, to do things for your fellow man. And ask yourself this question. How much beef and potatoes do you think New Yorkers would have if it all depended on human love and kindness? 
I'd be worried about New Yorkers. <laughs> Let me give you another example. You know, sometimes people say, you know, Williams, since you're trying to win friends and influence people, instead of saying greed, why don't you say enlightened self-interest? That sounds better. That's okay, but I, I like greed. <laughs> Let me give you another example of uh, greed and private property, self-interest, if you want to say. I've often pointed out to people that I don't care about future generations of Americans. Sometimes people stand in shock and horrified. They say, how come you don't care about future generations? I ask, what have future generations ever done for me? <laughs> and if they, hadn't done any, if they haven't done anything for me, how then am I obliged to do anything for them? Where is the quid pro quo? Well, if you watch my actual behavior, my behavior would belie that sentiment. For example, I have a nice spread in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. And uh, a number of years ago, maybe five or six years ago, maybe it could be longer than that, I took $400 that I could have bought a nice bottle of <coughs> Lafitte Rothschild Bordeaux wine <laughs> that I could have consumed selfishly. Nobody else would have enjoyed it except me. But I took that money and I put seedlings around my property. I planted some trees. Now, when those trees reach their full maturity, I'll be dead. There'll be some 20, 50 kid swinging in my trees, eating my apples and my pears. <laughs> A number of years ago, Mrs. Williams made extensive improvements, improvements to the house with a beautiful sunroom, with my earnings, by the way. <laughs> uh, now, that sunroom is going to outlast both of us. There'll be some 20, 50 kid tracking mud into my sunroom. <laughs> now, what's at least some of the reason why I made a sacrifice of current consumption to produce some good that's going to benefit somebody else. Well, it's very easy. The nicer my house is, the longer it will provide housing services, what? The higher the price I get when I go to sell the house. That is by pursuing my own narrow selfish interests, I can't help but make a house available for a future generation, whether I mean to or not. Now ask yourself, would I have the same incentives of, uh, for care if the government owned the house? Or if there were a 75% transfer tax when I went to sell the house? Anything that weakens my private property right interest in the house weakens my incentive to do the socially responsible thing, namely conserve on the scarce resources of our society. <clears throat> Now, let me, let me begin to close. Despite these virtues of the free market, never mind the fact that it was the rise of capitalism and free markets that brought about a more humane society, namely better treatment to women, better treatment to racial minorities, the handicapped, criminals, and the insane, there's considerable hostility towards the market. You know, I was giving this lecture at one uh, university and a lady stood up. Uh, she was a feminist. I don't call him what Rush calls him. But, <laughs> but she said, U.S. capitalism is oppressive to women. And so I asked her, I said, well, if you're a radical feminist, what country do you want to go live in? Uh, China? Uh, Saudi Arabia? Egypt? Iran? No, you want to live in the United States. Or, or on, if, if you are a criminal, where do you want to go to jail? Is, is it Mexico? You want to go to jail in the United States so that you don't miss your HBO shows in the afternoon. Now, 
The reason, which is a subject of another lecture, the reason why we've got a more humane society when with the emergence of free market or capitalism was that throughout most of mankind's history, to become very, very wealthy required that you loot, plunder, and pillage, and steal from your fellow man, enslave. But with the rise of capitalism, it became, uh, it, it became possible for people to become very wealthy by serving their fellow man, by pleasing their fellow man. How come Bill Gates is so rich? Well, he didn't rob anybody. He just produced a product that you voluntarily reached in your pocket and picked out uh, and forked over $400 for. He served his fellow man. Now, almost every group, one of the problems with the free market or capitalism in our country is that almost every group in the nation has come to feel that the government owes them a special privilege or favor. And I might, I might mention that conservatives, many conservatives are no, by no means exempt from this practice. Manufacturers feel that government owes them protective tariffs, that is to keep foreign goods out so they can charge you and me higher prices. Farmers feel that government owes them crop subsidies. Organized labor feels that government should keep their jobs protected from competition with those who are not union members. Intellectuals, college professors, feel that the government ought to give them funds for research. You know, college professors love to get uh, $200,000, $300,000 grants to do studies on poverty and have meetings, and have, and have meetings in, uh, in, in the winter at a nice hotel in uh, Florida to talk about poor people. <laughs> now, conservatives, will rail against food stamps, aid to families dependent children, legal aid, but they come out in support for aid to dependent banks, aid to dependent motorcycles, motorcycle companies. And, and they don't have a moral leg to stand on. Conservatives as well as liberals prove H.L. Mencken's definition of an election quite correct. H.L. Mencken, for those of you who've forgotten, he was a political satirist for the Baltimore Sun. And somebody asked H.L. Mencken to give a definition of an election. And H.L. Mencken replied, and I quote, government is a broker in pillage. Every election is an advance auction on the sale of stolen goods. <laughs> now, to the extent that H.L. Mencken is right, we've identified our problem. Too many of us want to blame politicians. And yes, we can blame politicians a little bit. But ladies and gentlemen, the bulk of the blame lies with you and me. Because politicians are doing precisely what we elect them to office to do. We elect them to office to use the power of their office to take what belongs to one American and bring it back to us. Now, you, you might say, well, Williams, uh, this is your first trip to Lubbock, and you just insulted us Texans. <laughs> well, let me ask you the following question. Imagine that I were running for the Senate for Texas, and I go back and forth across the state. I say, look, my fellow Texans, I, I've read the United States Constitution. I know what Congress should be doing. If you elect me to office, don't expect for me to bring back highway construction funds, uh, <clears throat> uh, aid to higher education. These are not in the Constitution. Uh, prescription drugs, all these other programs. Do you think I would get elected to the Senate from Texas? No, I wouldn't. Now, the true tragedy for our nation is that the people of Texas would be doing the absolutely correct thing by not electing me to the Senate. Why? Because if I don't bring back billions of dollars in highway construction funds and, and, and prescription drugs and aid to higher education, it does not mean that Texans will pay a lower federal income tax. All that it means is that Oklahoma will get it instead. 
That is, that's the tragedy for us, is that once legalized theft begins, it pays for everybody to participate in it. Those who do not participate will wind up holding the brown end of the stick, and you people from the rural area, you know what the end of that is. <laughs> so the big task before us is to somehow convince our fellow Americans on the moral superiority of personal liberty and its main ingredient, limited government. And I think that that is one of the jobs that the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech is going to do. We have to somehow convince our fellow Americans on the moral superiority of personal liberty. Now, some people have argued that we need to do something with taxes, we need to have maybe a constitutional convention. No, again, we have to somehow convince our fellow Americans. That is, we have to get back the feelings of yesterday. Let me just give, begin to close with, close with a, a quote from one of the acknowledged uh, founders of our country, uh, one of the acknowledged uh, writers of the Constitution of the United States, namely James Madison. And let me run you a, a, run a, a quote by you and, <clears throat> and let you ponder on what that would mean to a politician today to say, say the same thing. In 1794, Congress appropriated $15,000 to help some French refugees. James Madison, the acknowledged father of the Constitution, he stood on the floor of the House, irate, to object, saying, quote, I cannot undertake to lay my finger on that article in the Constitution which granted a right to Congress of expending on the objects of benevolence the money of their constituents. Can you imagine a politician saying that today? Can you imagine a president saying that? What, what, what the American people would do to him? So that's one of the things that we have to work on. That's the main job, is to restore some kind of, of liberty. Now, <clears throat> some kind of uh, notion of limited government that made us a very, very rich nation in the first place. Now, some of you will go back home and you say, well, that guy Williams has a very, very narrow interpretation of the Congress, of the Constitution, because there's the general welfare clause that allows Congress to do all these things. But let me uh, give you a quotation by Jefferson about the General Welfare Clause. Quote, Congress has not unlimited powers to provide for the general welfare, only those specifically enumerated. Or, or some of your friends might say, some of your legal friends might say, look, you know, Williams has a very limited understanding and appreciation for the Constitution because the Constitution is a living document. Now, anybody who tells you that the Constitution is a living document, they're suggesting that we do not have a Constitution at all. Because the Constitution represents rules of the game, and the rules of the game must be fixed or changed in an orderly way, such as Article 5. In other words, if you say you have a living Constitution or rules are living, it doesn't mean much. I mean, for example, after after my lecture tonight, how many of you would like to play me poker and the rules be living? <laughs> I mean, under certain circumstances, my two pair may beat your, 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 your flush. So, so when somebody says we have living constitution, you have to correct them. But maybe they might be right. Maybe that's what we have today where congressmen and, and uh, presidents and the Supreme Court just ignore the Constitution. And another thing, about the, speaking about the Supreme Court, uh, both Madison and Jefferson warned us, and I don't have the quote right here, they said something like, we should not allow the
the Supreme Court to have a, monop a monopoly on the interpretation of the Constitution. Otherwise, we live under oligarchy. And they are absolutely right. Let me, uh, uh, let, let me just say one, one final thing, that I've painted a pretty dismal picture, but there's a ray of hope. And the ray of hope is that the first two years of the Obama administration, where they, where they had Democrat control of the House and Democrat control of the Senate, these people became so brazen in the kind of things that they were doing that for the first time in, our, in my life, we had Americans debating about the Constitution. States, uh, states attorney generals brought suit against the federal government. You had uh, a number of states legislatures um, uh, pass uh, resolutions, 10th Amendment resolutions, demanding the, that the federal government obey the Constitution. Then there was a Tea Party movement. So this suggests that there might be an awakening in our country, but we still have a very long way to go. Thank you very much, and I welcome any kind of questions. <laughs>
I think that's uh, dangerous as well. Um, or many other things that would interfere with our sovereignty as a nation. And we ought to just reject it. And, and matter of fact, another t uh, technique that, that people are beginning to use is just to nullify uh, f uh, some federal laws. Matter of fact, I testified in the, in the legislature, this was uh, in March, of uh, South Carolina. They wanted me to give testimony to the legislature on nullifying Obamacare, making so that um, Obamacare was illegal in the state of uh, uh, South Carolina. And that measure uh, passed the lower house, but it did not get past the uh, second house, the uh, upper house. You have uh, uh, Oklahoma, I believe, uh, the governor uh, signed, nullified um, uh, some of the gun control issues, uh, laws written by the federal government. And so I think that uh, when, the, when the federal government exceeds its powers, I think that the legislature of the states should just remind them what article, uh, what uh, the 10th Amendment to the Constitution says. It says, the 10th Amendment says, <coughs> powers that are not delegated to the federal government belong to the people and the states. And many powers that have been exercised by the federal government were not a part of the Constitution. Yeah. Would you uh, please address uh, how the fair tax integrates with the free economy? The fair tax? Yes, sir. Okay, the fair tax is a, a tax where they, uh, where it'll be a sales tax kind of national sales tax that, that, that's revenue neutral. It doesn't have to be re re revenue neutral. And I think that uh, there are a lot of benefits from having a national sales tax. Uh, but I would never support the fair tax unless we got rid of the 16th Amendment. Because if we did not get rid of the 16th Amendment, we'd find ourselves with an income tax and a national sales tax. Yes. Yeah. You uh, argue that taxation is theft. It seems to me that if that were the case, then there would be no legitimate role for government. Well, no, I didn't say taxation is theft. I said that that there's some legitimate functions of the government, and we're each duty bound to pay our share. But when when the when the government takes the property of one person and gives it to another to whom it does not belong, that is theft. That is theft because what is the definition of theft? Theft is taking the rightful person, property of one person and giving it to another to whom it does not belong. And now keep in mind, with the, the example I gave you about the lady uh, on the grate where I took, uh, I took a gun and I had a gun and I took uh, Professor uh, Powell's $200. Well, that's theft, isn't it? Would it be theft if three people agreed with me? <laughs> what, about, what about if 100 people agreed to take his money? What about 100 million? We have a man with the right answer. He's, <laughs> he said, it's still theft. Uh, yes? Do you think it would help if we held national elections on April the 16th? <laughs> Well, I, I think it might help a little bit. Make, matter of fact, what I've suggested, one of the most dev devastating things happened during World War II. And that was, uh, prior to World War II, people paid their taxes every March 15th. But the federal government uh, thought that we should speed up collections. So they made the withholding tax. But they didn't call it a withholding tax at that time although it did the same thing, they called it a victory tax. <laughs> the withholding tax started out as a victory tax. Now that we won the war, but we still have the withholding. <laughs> and one of the problems with withholding is that it conceals taxes that the average American doesn't know. How much taxes he pays? If I had it my way, I, I would just change the law a little bit before I would repeal the, uh, the 16th Amendment I would just have a requirement where each, every American once a month had to go into the post office and pay his tax in $5 bills with his family standing there. <laughs>
just to have an idea how much he's paying in taxes. Because the average American, you ask your friends, you say, how many months a year do you think you work for the, to pay taxes? They wouldn't know because they have no idea. And keep in mind, we're almost on working on five months out of the year pay federal, state, and local taxes. And the founders of our nation went to war with the most powerful nation at the time because they did not want to work from January 1st until January 8th. <laughs> I think they'd be disappointed with us. Yes. Dr. Williams, one of the sources of economic progress and growth is a stable monetary supply. And the Federal Reserve still is pushing more stimulus and more, more, money, into the, more money into the economy. Will we ever see a return to a gold standard for a more stable money supply and maybe even an abolishment of the Federal Reserve? Um, well, I would, I would like to see the abolishment of the Federal Reserve, and I'm not absolutely sure about a gold standard. Um, I don't know whether we could ever get back to a gold standard, but however, one of the things we have to realize is that with a gold standard, it, it imposes some kind of discipline on the monetary authorities. And uh, right now, the monetary authorities, they don't have much to discipline uh, with them, uh, uh, discipline them. And so uh, we could easily have a rapid inflation, um, an inflation that happens very, very quickly. And keep in mind that the people who benefit from an inflation are debtors, because it redistributes income from creditors to debtors. And the largest debtor in our country is the federal government, so they would benefit uh, immensely from it. And, but they, you know, I, I've suggested to people, uh, and you might try this, if you're ever on trial, for counterfeiting. <laughs> Just tell the judge you were engaging in monetary policy. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, hello, Dr. Uh, Williams. Thank you for coming to Washington to speak to us. Um, it seems as though you're downplaying the uh, uh, dangers of an, uncorporate, of an unregulated corporate America. There's a myriad of different historical examples of when uh, when corporate America wasn't sufficiently regulated by the federal government that it hurt the economy and hurt uh, American workers. What's your stance on that? I would say it's absolutely wrong. I, I, I would say it's absolutely wrong. It's corporations sought, many corporations sought regulation by the federal government as a means to eliminate some of their competition. Matter of fact, the Antitrust Act was to eliminate some of their competition. Um, now, I'm not saying corporations uh, are, are angels, but if, they, but if they do something that is wrong, we have the power of the purse to, to stop them. That is, we just don't have to buy from them. But if you ask the question, we became, a ver we became the world's richest nation without all the regulation. <clears throat> if we had the same kind of regulation back in the 1800s that we have today, we would not. We would be a third-rate nation, just like we were in 1776. Yeah. Thank you for uh, taking my question. Um, I share this view with you that uh, you espouse uh, the uh, self-interest of the individual in a voluntary exchange as a great benefit in the free market. Uh, at the same time, that self-interest of human behavior plays out within our government. So my question to you is. How could we better uh, structure our government to harness that uh, human nature of self-interest of free government for the benefit of the uh, general welfare of the nation? Well, I, I think that the founders, the founders recognized that most evil done in the world is done by government. And they sought, matter of fact, it was it was Thomas Paine who says that government under the best circumstances is a necessary evil, under the worst, an intolerable one. The founders recognized that we do need some government. We do need some government. But the reason why they imposed constraints on government because they recognized the potential evil. I mean, the, the, the founders were deeply suspicious of Congress. I mean, just read through the Constitution. And particularly the Bill of Rights. Look at the language there. It says, 
Congress shall not infringe. Congress shall not prohibit. Congress shall not disparage. Now, if they did not think that Congress would do that, why did they put it there? <laughs> and matter of fact, I've suggested to people, when we die, and if at our next destination, we see anything like the Bill of Rights, we know that we are in hell. <laughs> because a Bill of Rights in heaven would be an insult to God. It'd be saying, you can't trust God. And so, but the founders recognized this, and, and matter of fact, if you read through the Constitution of the United States, I believe it's something like 44, or 40, 40 or 44 uh, statements that restrain Congress. That restrain Congress and the executive and the, uh, and the judiciary. And they were deeply suspicious, but we, we're not suspicious enough. We're, too, we're overly trustful. And so that's, 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 uh, that's you know, I, I think that they recognize, again, to answer your question, they recognize that we do need some government, but since government, the essence of government is coercion and evilness, they wanted to keep it as small as possible. Okay. Folks, thank you very much.